Hi, I'm Casey. I don't know what I'm doing. Today I'm going to talk to you about my opinions and give a review of How Literature Saved My Life by David Shields. This is a nonfiction written in collage style and published originally in 2013. Obviously this isn't going to be the most positive review. This is all my opinion. This video is here to specifically share my opinions. If this novel holds a special place in your heart or was influential to you in any positive way, I'm in no way, shape, or form trying to discredit that. I'm happy that this did something positive for you. Unfortunately, it just didn't for me. There were quite a bit of ups and downs in this book, especially at the beginning of it for me. The prologue was very confusing to me. It left me questioning whether this book was actually fiction instead of non-fiction. The writing style really surprised me and shocked me and left me wondering often what was happening. Eventually I began to understand the way that this book was written and found my footing and began to understand what the author was saying and how he was saying it. I won't recap the entirety of this novel in this video. I'm just going to hit some of the low points for me and talk about the things that bothered me about them. In the first portion of the novel, Negotiating Against Myself, there is an essay where Shields discusses a friend or someone he's acquaint acquaintances with who has let him read his unpublished memoir. The memoir is primarily set around his time in seminary school. This is framed around the 1990s when the news began to break of the rampant abuse by priests at the specific seminary school. And throughout most of the essay, if not almost the entirety of this essay, Shield speculates wildly on whether or not the author was abused himself. It's pervasive throughout the entirety of the essay and colors this other person's potential trauma specifically specifically as rumor, gossip, and entertainment for Shields. Obviously this is troubling, upsetting, and incredibly insensitive. I left a very bad taste in my mouth and was really the first time where I realized that this book was not going to work for me because of the content, not specifically because of the writing style. The second section of this novel, Love is a Long Close Scrutiny, this entire section was off-putting. I, I, I'm not even gonna say off-putting, this entire section was bad. It really cemented for me that this book was not going to work for me and that the content was going to upset me more often than not. The first essay was a recounting of a story that Shields had heard about two actors who were romantically involved, who were going to audition for a film, and the director demanded that they have sex in front of him. The essay recounts it almost as a quirky story and frames it from how weird love is when perceived as an outsider. To me, it just felt like two people were coerced and forced into a very uncomfortable situation. Shortly after, we have another essay where the author recalls his relationship with a woman in college. He brazenly talks about breaking into her dorm room to read her personal and private journals so that he can find out what her innermost thoughts are, specifically about him, but about th but, but about everything so he can become more of the person that she sees him to be and more of the person that she wants rather than himself. Obviously, this is really problematic. It's written about and framed as a funny college anecdote when in fact it reads much more as grooming and invasive. Even after he has won her over and they begin dating in earnest, he still breaks into her room to read her journals until he begins to feel guilty about it. Which why he didn't feel guilty in the beginning is a question that he doesn't even begin to answer and in fact just shape, just brushes off easily. but. I digress. After he feels guilty about it for some time, they both they both go back to their hometowns for winter break and he writes her a long letter where he confesses to this massive invasion of her privacy. She then writes him back and says that it's fine, she forgives him, and she just hopes he won't do it in the future. But their relationship fizzles out and he dismisses this. He dismisses this as and I quote here, when I was no longer reading her words, I was no longer very adamantly in love with her. The entire essay is really upsetting and dismisses her autonomy in their relationship and her 
personhood in their relationship and frame so much of their relationship as when he could no longer secretly be what she wanted, he lost complete interest in her. Shortly after this, there is another essay discussing a relationship with a woman and their, and specifically discussing their sex life. It's almost entirely about their sex life. It's almost entirely about their sex life and how he felt that the woman he was in a relationship with was only doing the things she was doing in their bedroom and in their sex life to somehow entertain him or to somehow leave a lasting impression on him. As a reader, it felt very dehumanizing to see this woman completely broken down into just what she did for him in the bedroom and to only frame it from the perspective of she didn't do these things because she wanted to or for her own pleasure, but from this need to make him remember her with no real reasoning behind why he felt that way, except for she couldn't have been doing the things that she was doing except to do that, except to make him remember her for the wild, crazy antics that they would both engage in. There's even a quote of, her goal seemed to be to burn images of herself into my retina forever. This is very characteristic of the writing in the entire essay and how he frames all of her actions and all of her desires. At this point in the novel, the overarching solipsistic tone begins to truly take over everything. People are really only framed from the perspective of what they had done for the author or how he could view himself and their actions. There's no real engaging with people as people. It is only as vessels to view himself in. Okay, now it's time to talk about the Tiger Woods essay. This is the most uncomfortable section in the entire book for me. There's an essay where the author is discussing schadenfreude and specifically he does this by talking about the 2009 Tiger Woods scandal and car crash. It's extremely uncomfortable to read right from the beginning. He calls Woods semi-handsome because he's losing his hair, a rather strange sentiment, but not in and of itself troubling. He then goes on to immediately call him semi-black. This is in and of itself troubling. There was no real reason that I could understand why he included his race, especially in the way he did. And it feels so out of place when you consider the entire essay is about the schadenfreude the author felt surrounding Tiger Woods's very public humiliation and downfall. This entire essay is him watching on as this happens to Woods and cheering it on. The author often talked about wanting Woods to taste life's darkness and talked specifically about studiously reading the sexts between Woods and a certain woman. It's very strange and it's very uncomfortable. To be quite frank, the optics of this are, are bad. They're bad. They are straight up bad. It reads as a successful white man cheering on the public humiliation and downfall of a more successful black man. This strange bias appears again at the end of the book. There's an essay in which the author is discussing sitting on the committee for the National Book Award one year, specifically the nonfiction committee, and all of and all of the things that that entailed. He concludes this essay by sharing an anecdote from his from his mentor who sat on the 1987 book award fiction committee in which Toni Morrison comes into the room after her novel Beloved has not won the award and says to his mentor, thank you for ruining my life. Shields then goes on to share the sentiment that if your life depends upon winning an award chosen by a few people over lunch, there's something wrong with your life. This is completely dismissive of the fact that many people, and specifically the Black literature community, felt that this was a direct snub to Toni Morrison and to Black literature as a whole. This is also dismissive of the fact that as a writer, Morrison probably was engaging in a bit of hyperbole to make her point loud and clear to this committee. It's a very strange way to end the essay, which overall had a rather frivolous and silly tone up until this point. There are more reasons I could discuss for why this book just didn't work for me, but these were the most egregious ones. Overall, the book just really wasn't for me, and I mean this in a few ways. 
First of all, this was a book I was never going to enjoy because of the way it was written. I had never read collage style up until this point, and I likely will never pick it up intentionally again. It just didn't work for me. To me, it felt like a shotgun blast of ideas, very few having a oppor having the opportunity to fully develop and communicate their intents, while consistently being overthought, overwritten, and quite frankly, just pretentious. This style of writing does not appeal to me, and it actively takes me out of the active reading, which I find to often be a meditative state. But the way it was written would often pull me out of it and make me very aware of the fact that I, that I was reading and that there were words on a page, if that makes sense. Secondly, I don't think this book was written with someone like me as the target audience. At the time of reading it, I'm 32 years old. At the time of its publication, I was 23 or 22. I don't think this book was written for someone in my age group. There's specifically being a millennial. There's a section in the last portion of the book that just reads like an old man angry at technology and at the youths for being in a world and actively shaping a world that he doesn't understand and that has moved past him. I don't think this book was written for someone of my sex or gender. As I said earlier, the solipsistic tones are really off-putting, specifically when it has to do with the women in his life. His daughter and wife are often only used to be to reflect on him and his actions and never to fully tell the reader anything about who they are as people and as women. I don't think this was written for someone of my social status, status or education level. This book really engages with a, I think this book would be great if it was engaging with a reader who had a deep appreciation for this aesthetic and collage writing in particular, but unfortunately I don't. And it overall feels very pretentious if you aren't, if you don't have that appreciation for what it is trying to do. Unfortunately, this book was just a one star for me. I waffled back and forth between a one and a two star, but once the Toni Morrison anecdote was shared, I decided, it, I really decided that this was just a one star and that this did nothing for me and I needed to stop pretending like it did anything. There were a couple of positive takeaways from this book. Firstly, collage style writing is not for me. It's always nice to find a book. It's always nice to find a book, even if it's one that you actively dislike while you're reading it, that challenges you and what you have read and how you read and engage with something and gives you more of an understanding of what works for you and what doesn't. And this didn't work for me, but now I know that and I won't actively pick up these types of books again. This book sat on my shelf for well over 10 years and the biggest takeaway I have from it is even if you've spent your money and wasted your money on it 10 years ago, you absolutely do not need to spend and waste your time on it now. Don't watch this, but do have a great day. Bye!